so much for inviting me. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, so this evening, I'm going to talk about the impact of actually really quite an historic event in the Alzheimer's arena, which has happened in the last few months. And that's the um, introduction of a medication called lecanemab. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in the context of what's happening in Alzheimer's disease now, particularly with respect to the avalanche of new biomarkers for early diagnosis and then new treatments to actually slow down or ideally halt progression of Alzheimer's disease. So this is a whole new paradigm now for treatment of Alzheimer's. So, but I'm going to take just two seconds first just to show you one or two slides about Recognition Health. We do have six centres open now. Um, we actually did open a centre in Bristol and in Winchester last year, and we are um, increasing our rate of growth. Um, we are also expanding our company in the US. So we opened in um, Washington, D.C. about three years ago. Um, we opened in Houston just uh, a few days ago. Um, we're going to be opening in Chicago in about two months, um, and then also in Dallas um, by the summer, uh, and probably another center in the US before the end of the year. So um, our focus is actually quite US-centric just at the moment, and that's partly because um, the rate of development of these new medications um, is um, meteoric <laughs> um, at the minute. Um, so we are actually um, established as national leaders in brain and mind um, expertise for medical legal work. We do lots of the big medical legal cases um, and also in private practice. We now cover the whole scope of brain and mind conditions. Um, we're also global leaders in cognitive clinical trials um, and we are the top recruiters worldwide in many of these big global studies. Um, and in fact, uh, currently there's several very big pharmaceutical sponsors that are only bringing their studies to Recognition Health um, centres in the UK in 2023. So um, this is really quite, quite, um, quite an achievement, I have to say. Um, so as I say, we're doing private practice, uh, clinical trials and medical legal. And we actually are sort of very much sort of focused on developing a platform whereby patients can quite easily access from one um, of our services to another. So somebody who maybe contacts us about clinical trials may find that actually what they're looking for is available in private practice or somebody enters us through the sort of like private practice door and then realizes that they may be eligible for a clinical trial. And for us, this is really important because it means that we're able to provide an absolutely sort of international level of care for our patients and give them access not just to, if you like, sort of like national standard of care for patients, but we're practicing at an international level. Um, so we do have a memory clinic. Um, we do provide memory um, services consultations at home as well as um, in our clinic. Um, and due to COVID, we actually developed... Um, a whole virtual service as well. So um, we found that obviously like everybody, we had to really refine our virtual service during COVID. And so now we actually have quite a national footprint in terms of providing virtually as well as providing for private patients in London and also at our Bristol Centre. We have uh, topically, uh, or quite topical, we have a, a long COVID clinic um, but then we have sort of like the whole spectrum. So from neuropsychiatrists, so we have neuropsychiatrists, um, neuropsychologists working together as well as therapists. And then we have psychiatry and we have neurology. So that's how we really sort of like cover the whole spectrum from um, sort of like mind and brain. Um, for children and adults, we have um, autism specialists and ADHD specialists. And that's both for diagnosis as well as therapy. Um, and then we also have a brain injury clinic. Um, this is actually, originally was very much in traumatic brain injury, but we've been very involved in CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy and contact sports and working with all the ex-rugby players, um, et cetera, with this um, really horrendous, um, rapid early onset um, dementia, which uh, is very startling. I'm just doing one or two slides just to put this in perspective. Now, it's just quite nice. We've got Dr. Keats, who, start, who many years before this was doing the um, trials with what are the symptomatic medications. And actually, these are the medications that are still um, the sort of mainstay of clinical treatment within clinical practice and on the market today, which is 
absolutely staggering when you think of all the new drugs that have come on the market for cancer, infection, immune conditions, etc. So in 2020, um, the Alzheimer's drug trials had a 99% failure rate. So I think this really sort of like just gives you an idea of it's difficult finding drugs that are going to get across the blood-brain barrier and that are going to change your brain. Um, and I think the brain really has been very much the sort of like last bastion um, for developing medications because it just is so complicated. But even then, people were upbeat that, you know, there were still, like, there were a hundred new medications um, in the pipeline. And a survey at the time showed that there were 121 unique therapies being tested um, in 136 trials. And actually, the main problem was that there just literally weren't enough people with cognitive problems volunteering to participate in the studies. And as you saw with COVID vaccine, if you haven't got enough people volunteering, it delays getting these drugs onto the market. Um, the you know the sort of like problem as well is that in 2018 WHO recognised Alzheimer's disease as a global pandemic. So a bit like buses, you wait for years for them to come along, and then you get two pandemics sort of like at the same time. And the staggering thing that, given it's a global pandemic, there is no treatment available in the UK that can change the course of the disease. And actually, up to about a month ago, in the whole world, um, so everyone who gets Alzheimer's disease will progress and die with dementia. So that's how serious this is. Um, so between 2021-2023, there have been absolutely seismic changes in the development of treatments in this arena. So the first big breakthrough is in June 2021. I'm sure you'll have seen this all over the news. The FDA approved a drug called aducanumab um, in the USA. Um, and then the big news in January of this year they undertook accelerated approval of this drug called lecanemab. Um, both of these medications are um, anti-amyloid monoclonal antibodies, and they are suitable really only for patients with early um, symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So this is very much in the mild cognitive impairment spectrum. Um, and I think that this is sort of like quite a nice statement that came out of the big um, CTAN mm -hmm. is Clinical Trials Alzheimer's Disease Conference in um, Philadelphia in, sorry, no, in San Francisco in November last year. And this was following the announcement of the results on lecanemab. And the big statement that was going around is that this is the end of the beginning in Alzheimer's disease, bio, Alzheimer's disease biomarker and treatment development. And it's well recognized that this is now really fueling and stimulating massive investment um, in Alzheimer's disease treatment development. So just to sort of like go back, so what's happening this period, June 2021, um, Aduhelm, which is the aducanumab treatment. So that was the first disease modifying therapy for early stage Alzheimer's. So this means a drug that is actually designed to treat the underlying cause and mechanism and thereby slow down further progression of disease. Um, it was available in the US, interestingly, and we, we have a site in the US, so we're very much sort of like got our finger on the button here. Um, it was marketed at about $32,000 a year just for the treatment. It was an IV infusion once a month. Um, and then in addition to that, you needed at least about $75,000 worth of MRI scans, PET scans, etc. So this is pretty much unaffordable. And also the um, insurance systems didn't pick this up. So um, really, I don't know that anyone is actually having this privately. Um, and it just stimulated interest in the clinical trials because it is available in the clinical trials. We have patients who are on this medication in clinical trial that have been with us for sort of like four or five years now. But the rationale for, and I think this is important, the rationale for FDA to approve this was this basis, that Alzheimer's is a, is a disease of greater prevalence and greater lethality than COVID-19. This was obviously topical because it was during the middle of the pandemic. This is an ongoing global pandemic. Its cost to America in terms of direct medical costs is significantly higher than cancer. So you know, this is just a huge problem. Approving aducanumab was associated with endless sort of like controversy, but it did stimulate the market funding and is created a huge impetus to both further research and awareness from public and from the medical profession. Um, just to sort of say that, um, despite what I'm going to explain next about the lecanemab success, 
There's another drug, uh, gantaneuramab, very same class of drug, so monoclonal antibody against a toxic amyloid protein. That was also, the results of that were also presented at um, the CTAD meeting in November, and that drug failed to demonstrate efficacy. Um, there were no safety issues, but the conclusion was probably they'd administered it too late in the disease, um, and people had higher levels of amyloid protein. So these patients still had mild cognitive impairment, but it's really demonstrating that you've got to get in early, otherwise um, these drugs don't work. Um, so this is lecanemab, and I'm just going to give you the sort of like top line results. Um, again, we've been doing this study, and um, I'm actually going to show you a short video of two of our patients who've been on the study. Um, so this is ESI, is the pharmaceutical company, it's a global phase three study, and the study is called the Clarity Study. Um, it was a double-blind placebo controlled. You can see there was nearly 2,000 participants. You can see the age range. And actually, um, so many people talk about, oh, you can't possibly have Alzheimer's if you're in your 50s. Wrong. You can. And we have lots of people who do. Um, people had either mild cognitive impairment or mild AD dementia, defined just by the cognitive results on the um, testing. Um, and it was, uh, you're on active or placebo one-to-one -one for 18 months, randomized. And then at the end of that 18 months, everybody, regardless of which group they're in previously, would then receive the active medication. And this is the format of nearly all of the clinical trials that we do. So randomized for the first period for the trial proper. And then at the end of that randomized period, everybody gets the active medication. So all of our patients now who were on the study during the randomized portion, every single one of them now is receiving the active medication. I'm feeling pretty good about it. Um, Primary endpoint was a, a, psych, a psychometric assessment, um, but the study did also look at the levels of um, amyloid in the brain after this treatment designed to remove the toxic amyloid protein. Um, and it was, an, and it is still, an intravenous infusion every two weeks. So as you can see, this is a sort of like high maintenance situation. Um, it, the top line results is that it showed a significant reduction in the toxic amyloid beta plaque in the brain, um, and a 27% reduction on the rate of progression of Alzheimer's cognitive symptoms at 18 months compared to the placebo. And so clearly it's not, you know, this isn't sort of like absolutely life-changing, but it is certainly demonstrating that it isn't possible to alter the disease trajectory for Alzheimer's. So that is like huge, like it is possible to treat Alzheimer's. And actually prior to this, there have been so many anti-amyloid trials which had sort of like failed that the question really was being asked like, you know, is amyloid a cause of Alzheimer's? Is it just a sort of like looking at the scar after someone's had Alzheimer's? Like, you know, what exactly is going on? But it does look as if, you know, definitely amyloid is, is intricately related to the cause of Alzheimer's, but not the only one. Um, the big thing really that, you know, if you've read any of the, any of the information about this is the whole question of side effects as with any medication, but it's always risk versus benefit. In the study, and certainly in terms of clinical practice, if this comes on the market, the only people that will be able to receive it um, will have to have an Alzheimer's diagnosis proven by demonstrating amyloid, toxic amyloid protein in their brain. So you're never going to be taking this medication unless you have absolutely biomarker-confirmed Alzheimer's disease. And if you have biomarker-confirmed Alzheimer's disease, you are going to progress. I mean, that is, it's like a cancer or something else. Um, the death was the um, same in the placebo as in the um, active group. And then there's this thing called ARIA that you probably will hear people talk about if you've not heard about this already. And this is really the main side effect of these monoclonal antibodies. Um, and it stands for amyloid-related imaging abnormality. And this is actually really important. This is something that we see on imaging. And that's the reason why we have to do frequent MRI brain scans. And again, why this is very expensive, because they all have to have brain scans, sort of almost like, sort of like two weekly when they first start on the medication. And it is related to the removal of the amyloid protein from the brain. And you get a little bit of sort of like vascular leakage and um, sort of like inflammation. So ARIA-E is sort of effectively just some focal edema in the brain. Um, and although the incidence was 12.6%, only 2.8% had any symptoms. And these symptoms by and large are pretty mild, as you can see, their headache, visual disturbance. 
Um, but we actually have had a, we did have a patient, I've only had about three patients since I've been working with these medications in, since 2013 that have actually sort of like required admission to hospital and needed IV steroids to help bring down the ARIA changes. But um, in most instances, the patient is unaware. You interrupt the medication and the, uh, and the um, imaging changes just resolve. You restart the medication and it's fine. And it's related really just to the sort of like rate of removal of the amyloid protein, which is obviously very fast to begin with because if you're halving it and halving it and halving it, and then once you've got rid of most of the amyloid, then further treatment doesn't have a dramatic rate of change of, relo of removing the amyloid. So that's why you get the IRA at the beginning. And then when you reintroduce it, it's very, it's very rare. Um, then there were macro images in five participants um, compared to the placebo group. So this was a sort of like cause of concern, but every single individual case, I haven't gone into it here, that's been looked at, it's usually because they were on anticoagulants or something else as well. So there's, there's been quite a lot of work sort of like looking as to how to decrease these risks. So this just shows you very quickly, this is from the um, New England Journal of Medicine. It was published on the same day, just literally an hour after the presentation uh, in November. And it just shows the top graph is just showing the, plus the people on lecanemab showed a slower rate of, re of decline in their cognitive function compared to the placebo group. So that's the sort of like 27% slower rate of decline. And obviously what we don't know is what happens after 18 months. And then this is quite striking. It shows that the people on placebo carried on accumulating amyloid protein, whereas the people on lecanemab basically cleared out amyloid protein from their brain. So is lecanemab available to patients now? So um, yes, in clinical trials, um, plus lots of other, and I'll go into this, but potentially even more promising medications, because obviously pharmaceutical sponsors aren't going to waste billions, and these studies do cost billions, on drugs that are going to have less um, attractive results than lecanemab. So the, the studies that we're continuing to do and new studies we're starting are all expected to have even better results. Um, so outside clinical trials, it is available in the US um, as of January. It's called Lakembi. Um, it's about $26,000 a year for the medication. Plus you have to have two weekly intravenous infusions. You have to have lots of MRI scans which are all, and PET scans, which are all very expensive in the US. So you'd be looking at at least 100,000 a year. And there's huge debate going on in the US at the minute about whether or not the sort of like Medicare um, will approve this and the other insurance companies. Um, and it could, it could be approved later in the year. But what will start to happen, just the same as with the trials today, where people can be on denepazil, rivastigmine, galantamine, mamantine, and then they add in the, um, the new medications. So they'll add in the, the, um, whatever the trial medication is. So in this instance, they'll probably have people on lecanemab, and then they'll add in the other medications. Um, so in the um, UK, uh, just so if your patients ask you, because like everyone's reading about this everywhere, um, it has been submitted for approval for, at the um, European Me Medical Agency, that's the EMA, um, and the EMA is expected to recommend it to the European Commission to be approved or not um, in quarter one, quarter two of next year. Um, to be available in the UK, um, it must also be approved by MHRA. And at the minute, following Brexit, MHRA will follow decisions by EMA up to January 2024. So my guess is it's going to go all the way around the loop again and, and MHRA will take forever to decide whether to approve it. And that would really just put it on the market so it would be available for private patients. Um, but the chance of NICE approving lecanemab, I personally think, is, is like really, really small because this will be extremely expensive. And again, again, remember this people with mild cognitive impairment. So, but I think this is sort of like, you know, one of the most important things. What, what does this actually mean to your patients if they get a chance to get onto this treatment or your relatives or your friends? So, as I said, many individuals have been receiving both and still are receiving aducanumab and lecanumab at Recognition Health at several of our sites, including our US centers, um, plus... Um, other new medications that are on different trials, which we can talk about. And in fact, in November 2023, Fergus Walsh, who's head of um, medical reporting for the BBC, 
film two of our patients and their participants in order to release this um, at the time of the CTAG conference. So I don't know if any of you saw this in, on the news, but I'm just going to show you this is just one couple um, who actually joined um, a clinical trial with us during lockdown when they were unable to get to a memory centre or anywhere. So we took them from literally saying, I'm a bit worried, to getting them on the study, and here they are now. It's being described as a momentous and historic breakthrough. A major trial of an experimental dementia drug has shown for the first time that the progression of early stage Alzheimer's disease can be slowed down. Nearly 2,000 patients took part in the study. Full results have been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The effects of the treatment were small but have prompted huge excitement among researchers. Our medical editor Fergus Walsh reports. Could you get the broccoli out of the fridge for me, please, love? Yeah, OK. David Essam is 78 and has early-stage Alzheimer's. He's taken away his independence. He's now totally reliant on me or other people around him. He used to be a joiner, but no longer remembers how to use his woodworking tools. I would have liked to have still been making my furniture, which I can't do. So I'm just going to show you the hippocampus, and that's where all our short-term memory is stored. Alzheimer's gradually destroys key areas of the brain involved in memory and understanding. David is one of nearly 2,000 patients who took part in a major trial of a new drug, lecanemab. As normal, if you just lift your arm up there for me. It involved having an infusion every two weeks. Lecanemab didn't stop Alzheimer's. I'll just get you started here. But over 18 months, it slowed its progression by about a quarter. This is so exciting because now we're getting results, the first results that are indicating that the drug is successfully treating the underlying cause and is slowing down the symptoms of cognitive impairment and also the behavioural symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease. David and his wife Cheryl can't be sure if the drug is making a difference, but they're delighted to have taken part in the trial. When we first began this two and a half years ago, um, we didn't necessarily think it would help us, um, but we felt we were doing something and could help future generations. It's just a horrible, nasty thing. So if, you, if, you, if somebody can slow it down, and then eventually get it stopped altogether, you know, that would be brilliant. At least half a million people across the UK are living with Alzheimer's, by far the most common form of dementia. Lecanemab is designed to help those in the early stages of the disease. But if it gets approved, that will still mean there'll be a huge demand for the drug. You look good when you laugh. Happy. The drug has potential side effects, such as brain swelling. But despite all the limitations, this is a significant moment in the fight against Alzheimer's. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. I actually do want to just spend two secs on another sort of like historic piece of news at CTAD. And like a lot of things, that um, you know, two, two things that like happen at once. So. The other thing, the, the other um, result that was presented was for a medication called HMTM. Now, this is an anti-tau medication. In a minute, I'll show you how the anti-amyloid and the anti-tau medications work. Um, but this was for a study called Lucidity. And actually, again, at Recognition Health, we have been working with HMTM since 2013. And I actually have patients on HMTM. It's a complicated story, but they're on an early access program. They're on the original... Um, sort of like pre-lucidity HMTM study and all of their contemporaries who they knew through memory centres and things are all dead and Sorry. I've got some of these patients I, who are I really well so it's um, hydroxymethyl methyl methanoate Thank so you. it's basically a methylene blue derived right. salt I was going to write up there and I just thought in case somebody asked but <laughs> so um, so this is an oral, it's a tablet, anti-tau medication. Um, this particular study, because it was a sort of like a second phase three study, had nearly 600 participants. Again, 
MARD AD um, or um, MCI. And again, they all had to be proven to be amyloid positive. So they all had a definite biomarker diagnosis. Um, and the pathological aggregation of tau protein, which I'll explain to you, correlates with the clinical disease severity. So it's, the tau is very important and also the extent of brain atrophy. Um, so it's a key target for any new disease-modifying treatments. The top-line results here were that, again, the tablet has a very strong profile. Because it's again, aimed against tau, not amyloid, it doesn't have this ARIA problem. Um, and patients on the HMTM demonstrated improvement in their cognition um, over their pretreatment baseline, and that was shown to be sustained over 18 months. Um, and generally there was a sort of like a 72% reduction in progression of disease. So the other one was a 27% reduction. So this is like seriously big news. Um, and the, um, the company is TowerX, and they are actually sort of like working on um, starting to um, file for um, FDA approval for this medication now. I mean, sort of like, interestingly, and I, I don't know, I did a TED talk um, last sort of like summer, and um, I mentioned that for various different reasons, this medication is available in something called an early access program. And because it's aimed against tau, and we know that tau is the problem for people with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, so for the NFL players and for the rugby players, I have a small group that we are actually giving this HMTM to um, ex-rugby players or people you'll have heard about in the news to see if we can slow down their CTE. Um, so we have patients, as I said, taking HMTM, Sorry, uh, CTE. chronic traumatic encephalopathy, yes. which is a complication the from the contact sports. sports. Yeah, the NFL. Dementia, essentially. essentially, yeah. Um, and so we have lots of patients who have been on um, HMTM um, since 2013. So that's sort of like where we should all be, but this is sort of where we are, essentially, is where most of us are seeing Alzheimer's in 2023. Um, and this is actually a sort of like a national survey, people aged 55 and over, and there are numerous surveys across the world that have shown pretty much the same results. So 81% of people who are um, surveyed recognise difficulty in remembering recent events as a symptom of dementia, but were unaware of really sort of like other symptoms. Um, and they're also unaware that Alzheimer's disease is still the only leading cause of death across the whole world that is still on the rise. So recognising the symptoms um, of cognitive impairment, obviously when it's advanced, it's easy, but there aren't really any points for making a diagnosis when it's advanced. But this is the thing that most people, and it's their sort of like relatives and friends miss, <laughs> is it's not just short-term memory. It's this whole sort of like plethora of essentially one's thinking ability, so judgment, planning, calculation ability, inhibition, problem solving, visuospatial problems, concentration. It's all of these. And it's amazing when I actually see patients, which I do all of the time, and I actually go through these different cognitive domains. And it's amazing how many people say, oh yeah, you know, I noticed two years ago, my facility with numbers was being affected. Or, and one of the other ones that so many people say is that I had sort of inexplicable anxiety. And actually this sort of like inexplicable anxiety that develops in people certainly sort of like over, you know, like 65, 70. It, it's, it, don't just assume that they got inexplicable anxiety. It's, um, you know, it may well be associated with early symptoms um, of cognitive impairment. Um, and this is the other massive misunderstanding. I have so many patients who come in and tell me that they've got a diagnosis of dementia. There is no such thing. Dementia, you know, and I try to explain this to our patients, is that dementia is just an umbrella term like headache. So it's essentially saying there are lots of causes of dementia. As you get older, Alzheimer's disease is by far and away the most common cause, 70, 80, 90 percent. But Alzheimer's disease only sits underneath the dementia umbrella when it is, fulfills the criteria of cognitive impairment in at least two domains, as per the last um, slide. It must be progressive for at least six to 12 months, and it must impact on activities of daily living. So in other words, the individual is losing independence. But for 99% of the time that someone has Alzheimer's disease, it does not sit under the dementia umbrella. They don't have dementia. 
they have Alzheimer's disease. And this is why, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, why these biomarkers are so important, because we have to be able to pick up Alzheimer's disease long before it causes dementia. So just sort of like quickly understanding sort of like cause of Alzheimer's disease. And again, I mention this because so few of our patients really sort of like understand this. And it also is a problem with them understanding how the current medications work and therefore how new medications are, might work. And to be honest, it is a sort of like, as we find out more and more, it's an increasingly complex condition. But just very sort of briefly, in terms of the main sort of drugs that are sort of like coming into final phase now, that it's due to accumulation of abnormal toxic beta amyloid protein outside the brain cells. And these clumps of amyloid protein get dumped down on top of the cognitive brain cells for some reason it affects the cognitive brain cells first in the sort of like hippocampal area where we have all our short-term memory. And when it gets dumped down on top of the brain cells, they can't function normally. So like any cell in the body, the only thing it can do if it can't function normally is it just atrophies and dies. So the same as if you break your arm, you put a plaster on to stop the muscles moving to keep the bones still. When you take the plaster off, your muscle cells have all died. But muscle cells, unlike brain cells, can regenerate. So you do all your physio and your muscle cells come back. But the problem with the brain cells is that once they've been destroyed by these clumps of amyloid protein, they don't come back. Um, and then the tau protein is different. The tau protein is inside the brain cells um, and it destroys the brain cells effectively from inside. And I'll explain how that works. Suffice to say that there's a lot of focus now on different neuroinflammatory processes and mechanisms which really tend to be upstream of the abnormalities with the amyloid and the tau. So it's almost like once you're amyloid and tau, you're sort of like downstream, and now you've got the thing that's actually destroying the brain cells. But what you really want to know is what's, what's causing the thing that's causing the amyloid and the tau. So this is just very briefly what happens with amyloid protein. So essentially, we all have this um, apoprotein E amyloid in the brain. Little fragments of that, A beta fragments, get broken off by various enzymes. And if you get too much of that broken off, then you get too much production of these little single A beta fragments. Then there are all sorts of inflammatory factors and cofactors that cause these fragments to bunch together and, and create this amyloid plaque. And it's that amyloid plaque, as I just said, that gets dumped down on top of the brain cells. And that results in the brain cells dying. And so the way in which the current medications work is they work down here. You're losing brain cells, and they're just designed to try and make the remaining brain cells work a bit more efficiently to make up for the brain cells that you've lost. But they're not in any way affecting prior to neuronal loss. So they're not impacting at all on what's happening up here. But the new medications are designed to reduce the burden of this amyloid plaque. So to either reduce its production or to increase its clearance. So the drugs like lecanemab and aducanumab, they work here. They increase the clearance of the abnormal amyloid protein. So if, you can, if you've got too much production and aggregation, if you can increase the clearance, you get back to a status quo. So the graph that showed you that you're clearing your amyloid out of the brain, it's working here and clearing out the amyloid. So the, put it very sort of, sort of like simply, the current medications help the dying brain cells to function a bit more efficiently, and the new medications, the disease-modifying medications, stop the brain cells from dying in the first place. And you've obviously got to be up here because it's a bit too late when you're down there. Um, now this is how the tau protein works. So this is the HMTM in the lucidity study. So what happens here is that inside the brain cell, um, you have tau protein as a normal structure and it keeps the integrity of the brain cell, keeps that brain cell healthy. But for some reason, that tau protein just starts to become disfigured and it can no longer maintain the sort of like integrity inside the brain cell. And the brain cells involved in cognition tend to be quite long because they're going all across the brain. And so if the little neurofibrils and everything inside the brain cell have lost their integrity, they just all start to get sort of like confused and the brain cell doesn't work properly. But more importantly, what happens is that little abnormal tau protein undergoes some sort of nucleation event and it then becomes able to reproduce itself. 
So the single abnormal tau protein starts to replicate itself and replicate and replicate and replicate so that eventually it just fills up the brain cell and the brain cell bursts. <coughs> and you're left with what's called a tau tangle. Brain cell gone, can't regenerate. But the problem with tau protein is it's even more dangerous because what the tau protein does is it has the ability to jump from one brain cell to the next across the synapse. And as it does that, it then effectively infects the next brain cell and the whole process continues. So as you can see, it's not just like one brain cell to one, it's one million brain cell to another million brain cells and that's to another four million brain cells. So essentially you can see why the rate of progression of deterioration of someone with Alzheimer's disease increases with time because your, you know, your, your rate of spread like a cancer just gets faster and faster and faster. So the new medications work in two ways. One, the star up there is, how, I mean, there's probably lots of ways, but the, the star up there is representing the, the um, HMTM. The way that works is it gets into the brain cell, it dissolves the abnormal tau protein inside the brain cell, and the brain cell just exudes the tau protein. So the brain cell goes along happily, having got rid of the tau protein. And obviously, if you can get rid of the tau protein, then you've got less brain cells spreading it to other brain cells. There are also monoclonal antibodies, similar to the amyloid monoclonal antibodies, but these are against tau. And what they do is they grab the abnormal tau protein as it's jumping from one brain cell to the next, and they remove it. So you remove it out of the extracellular space with these monoclonal antibodies, and you remove it out of the intracellular space with other medications. And unlike amyloid, as I said, the stage of tau pathology correlates well with the um, cognitive impairment. So as I said, there's sort of like today, there are lots of other medications that we're working with that have different mechanisms. So there's epigenetics. So these are ones that are sort of like gene silencing. They're stopping the genes that are causing this problem. So in other words, sort of like genes that have gone a bit awry, they're a bit like cancer treatments. They're trying to correct those gene errors so that they don't continue to code. Um, there's various antivirals, there's antibacterials, there's anti-neuroinflammatories. Um, so there's just like lots and lots of different, different mechanisms. Um, so just a quick slide, and I only put this in in terms of how and why the new me medications are different from the current ones, because it's rare as hen's teeth that we see patients who actually understand how this works. And one of the reasons they don't understand how there can be new medications or they don't understand that these medications are just symptomatic is because they don't understand how they work. Um, and it, it's, as you know, it's sort of like really simple. So the nerve impulse is coming down the presynaptic neuron. It triggers the release of the acetylcholine in the terminal nerve endings. That acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that carries the message across to the next nerve. And if you're sort of like, you know, firing on all cylinders, you've got loads of, loads of impulses coming down and lots of acetylcholine being released. But if you want to sort of, you know, chill out and go to sleep or whatever, then you have something called acetylcholine esterase and your acetylcholine esterase effectively sort of like absorbs your acetylcholine so that, you know, the, the nerve isn't continuing to fire at, at full volume the whole time. So one of the problems is that if you're killing off your nerve, so if you've got your amyloid stuck on top of that presynaptic nerve um, or you've got tau inside it, you're killing the very nerve that is producing your neurotransmitter to send your message across to the um, postsynaptic neuron. So the problem is that you haven't got enough, as the nerves are beginning to die off, you haven't got enough acetylcholine in the brain bath to carry your messages across to the other nerve. And that's why also the people sort of like dip down suddenly because suddenly if you reach a critical point, you just haven't got enough transmitter. So the way the, and you've got your acetylcholine esterase out here, and the way dinepazole river stigmine and galantamine work is they effectively just block the acetylcholine esterase so that you preserve as much acetylcholine as possible. And so all you're doing is your nerves are being destroyed and all you're doing is with your symptomatic medications is you're blocking your acetylcholine esterase to have more acetylcholine available. Um, to carry the messages across from one nerve to the other. Um, and this just sort of like shows that diagrammatically in that obviously you don't wake up one morning with an atrophied brain, you sort of gradually change. But today we're sort of looking at people who've got 
if you think of this as tau protein spreading all around your brain, it starts off like a tiny little bit and then it gradually spreads around the brain. And today, people are being treated with maybe advanced MCI or mild AD dementia, um, but with these existing medications, but you can sort of see, you sort of like way miss the boat. Whereas the new medications, um, they need to be given really sort of like very early. So up here, when you're just beginning to get the disease, but obviously you can't, I mean, actually, which I'll show you in a minute, we do know when people are normal and they have amyloid and tau in their brain because with these fancy biomarkers, we can measure it. And we actually have had some studies for the same type of medications for people who are completely cognitively normal, but the idea of giving them, we find out, do they have amyloid and tau protein? And if they do, they then take the medication, the purpose being to prevent them or push out the time that they might otherwise develop cognitive symptoms. And probably about 10 years from now, we'll be assessing everyone around the age of 50, and you've got high amyloid or tau, you'll just take a medication to get rid of it out of the brain to prevent you, just the same as treatment for diabetes or hypertension or anything else. Um, but today we're using existing medications here, but in the clinical trials, we're using new generation medications up there on the left. Um, but new medications are actually, as you probably realize, only half of the solution. So the game changers really are prevention um, and effective early treatment. And in order to be able to do that, you've got to understand the pathological process and you have to have biomarkers that will tell you you have the pathology there, just like measuring blood sugar or blood pressure, before you start to develop symptoms, or at least when symptoms are very mild and also biomarkers that can tell you if your treatment is being effective. So you can measure them at different intervals. And then you need the new generation treatments to slow a whole progression. So you need to be able to tell you've got the disease very early and you need to be able to give treatments to slow it down as early as possible. So this really, to be fair, is just saying the same thing. You want to confirm that symptomatic or even asymptomatic AD and you want to be able to treat it. And the interesting thing is these biomarkers are present for about 20 years before you actually start to develop symptoms. So it's actually a perfect disease to treat because you've got loads of time to find out you've got the problem, and, you know, about bowel polyps for cancer or, you know, prostate or anything else. And then you can, you've got plenty of time when you can try to prevent it developing. So this, I think, is really important. And it's saying that this biomarker revolution has enabled us to redefine Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is now defined as, not by me, but, you know, like in the world, as a biological entity defined entirely by amyloid tau and new neurodegeneration biomarkers, irrespective of clinical symptoms or functional decline. So what are these biomarkers? So like in 2023, so this is sort of probably where most people are, you know, MRI, sort of like structural MRI to exclude... Well, and this is like really confusing. It, most of the patients that we see have normal MRIs. So, you know, everyone who says, oh, you haven't got Alzheimer's because you haven't got atrophy in your MRI, it just is literally of no sense whatsoever. Um, and we do the MRIs to check that they haven't got something else. Um, like, I don't know, you know, like a stroke or something. Um, and then it also helps as symptoms progress, to distinguish it from, say, frontotemporal dementia, Louis, body dementia, you know, like other, other causes of progressive cognitive impairment. Um, SPEC scans, um, FTG PET scans, that looks at glucose metabolism, CSF, amyloid and tau. And the, these things are sort of like um, available, like today, in the market. Um, more complex tau, sort of like anti-inflammatory or neuroinflammatory markers, um, that's really only available in clinical trials. Amyloid PET, that is available, but it's very limited in the NHS. And, and to a certain extent, there's not really much point in knowing you've got amyloid if you haven't got anything to treat it. You know, so, um, and similarly with tau PET, we do tau PET, amyloid PET on all of our patients. So we give them a biomarker, most accurate diagnosis in the world, sort of like diagnosis. And it's really important for knowing you haven't got Alzheimer's just as much as for knowing that you have got Alzheimer's. Um, and then we are also working with blood amyloid and tau markers now. So this is sort of like the future, but these are not available on the market yet. Um, and as I said, it, it's also really important we do a comprehensive blood panel to exclude reversible causes of cognitive decline, because the last thing you want to do is not to reverse something that's reversible. 
So I think this is really the, the, the paradigm that certainly that we work from. So essentially, everyone is on this spectrum. So you're either clinically normal and you have no biomarkers, or you're clinically normal, but you do have evidence of biomarkers for amyloid, tau, alpha-synuclear, you know, other um, uh, biomarkers. And the, this is really sort of like where people are going to be in the future. And we are, have been doing some clinical trials for people at that point. And obviously the whole agenda is to prevent you from crossing the midline. So once you cross the midline, now you've got symptoms and you've got more biomarkers or you're down here with sort of like full-blown Alzheimer's disease, dementia and a head full of biomarkers. Um, so why is early diagnosis important in 2023? Hopefully I've already demonstrated to you why it is. But it's actually, it's not just drug intervention, it's also the non-drug non interventions. But today there is actually everyone, everyone here has the opportunity to access these new generation treatments. Um, and it's a chance to change your outcome as per, you know, what the, the ESMs just found us and contacted us um, during lockdown when they couldn't get to a memory centre or anything and ended up sort of getting, being some of the first patients to... Um, receive a successful drug and it, it, it is a chance to improve your future and as I said I don't think you should ever underestimate hope. Um, at least 30% of dementia, so now this is all causes dementia, um, are actually the result of modifiable risk factors and, and they are just all the boring ones that you will know, you know, diet, exercise, limit alcohol, stop smoking, exercise your brain, Sleep is sort of like becoming, I think everyone is recognising that, you know, we're probably the worst people in, in the sort of medical profession for sleep, but, you know, I, I probably work on this one now. <laughs> it's, um, you know, it, it, I mean, all these things are, are really important. And it has been shown, particularly exercise, not so much, ex well, exercising your brain, but physical exercise. Um, there's a recent um, paper that's shown that once you've got Alzheimer's, it doesn't really slow down the rate of progression of symptoms but it does actually um, decrease your risk of developing Alzheimer's. Um, so are we getting closer to the answer? And you'll be pleased to hear the end. Um, so I think what is important is Alzheimer's is not one disease, but it's many disease. Um, and each is caused by the collapse of systems crucial to the functioning of our brain cells that do the thinking. Um, genetic flaws certainly will hasten the process. Um, but the most powerful force is something that is universal, inescapable, and that is the relentless passage of time. So the biggest risk for Alzheimer's disease is age, and unfortunately we don't really understand aging very well. But what is quite interesting is the research that's being done in Alzheimer's is actually merging very much into the research that's being done on slowing down aging and vice versa. Um, so it is a... It's a absolutely fascinating area of um, development um, but there are so many potential treatments in the pipeline currently there are more treatments potential treatments in the pipeline and more clinical trials than there have ever been before and this really is just to sort of like summarize Alzheimer's is not one condition it's not one biomarker and it's not one treatment so we are at the beginning as it said it's the end of the beginning so we're at the beginning of the next phase um, of probably something that is like as complex as you know infection or cancer in so much as that there are all these different um, biomarkers all these different things going on in the brain that are all working at different times they'll probably all have separate biomarkers and they'll all have separate treatments um, so it, it is a really complex condition um, and one treatment will certainly not be the cure now, I don't think anyone would think that but there is hope and I think this is sort of just a nice summary of clinical trials are now focusing on increasingly sophisticated understanding, approach and solution. So time of intervention, like do you give the drug early? Do you give the drug a bit later? Which ones do you give earlier? Do you give it in short intervals? We're just about to start a study where um, the treatment is actually in short intervals and when your amyloid protein comes down into the normal range, you then stop the treatment for a while and then you restart it if they come back up. So, um, sequential treatment, do you give amyloid first, then do you give tau and other treatments, age of presentation, as I said, in the future it definitely will be everybody will be starting this treatment sort of probably in their late 40s, 50s, um, measuring the success, for a long time people were really just measuring the removal of proteins, whereas now it's really very focused on clinical meaning, meaningfulness, so there's no point in 
like anything, there's no point in correcting, um, correcting the abnormality if you still end up without any improvement in your cognitive decline. So um, there are lots of phase two, phase three studies. Um, like um, any clinical trial, most of them will be double blind randomized. Um, nearly all of them now have open label extension. So this means that anybody who joins the trial, even though they may be randomized for the first part of the trial, they will then all, regardless of which group they're randomized to in the first part of the trial, they will then all receive active medication. And we actually have an amazing study starting hopefully about mid-April, um, which in, it's for the new Eli Lilly um, uh, monoclonal antibody. And in that study, it's a sort of like a crossover. So everybody gets drug and placebo. So like everyone is getting drugs. So it, it, it's absolutely incredible. Um, this is just an example of um, what a clinical trial looks like. Um, these are just all the different sites across the world. And basically, the whole world is just sort of like competing to get their patients into the trial. So we're sort of like up here in the UK and actually over there in the US. But it's, it's literally, it's just first come, first served. And if we're all asleep and the people over here are madly getting everyone into their trials, then no place is left for us um, or for our patients. And at the minute, it's a real problem because MHRA are really slow in at approving studies. So we have studies at the minute. In fact, this one I just mentioned, this big yellow list study that's open in our US center and, and about to open in our new center in Houston. And it probably won't open in the UK till sort of like middle or end of April. But by then, like half the people will, be, will already have been recruited. So we already have, I think, about 162 patients just waiting to come in. So just literally waiting for the study to open. Um, how it works? Um, very easy. This is the easiest bit. You just contact us. Um, most of our patients, to be honest, find us on Facebook, Twitter, um, radio, and they just literally contact us. Um, and they ask us why their doctors didn't tell us about these things. Um, but just, you know, tell us about a patient and we will contact them. It, it's literally that simple. We have a whole team that are calling patients all day, every day, literally around the clock because they work for the US as well as the UK. So someone will answer the phone any time from, I don't know, 8 in the morning till 2 in the morning because um, we don't want anyone to miss out. Uh, these are just our sort of like contact details. Um, I think that's it. So thank you very much. Excuse me. Uh, I don't know anything about processed sugar in uh, Alzheimer or something. Sugar. So um, there's lots of sort of, you know, that's a big topic in so much as that the brain hates sugar. Um, and particularly if you've got Alzheimer's, the brain will hate sugar because just the brain hates sugar. <laughs> um, and um, there, there are quite a lot of sort of like correlations in so much as that people who do have diabetes, if their blood sugar is poorly controlled, they, they tend, it tends not to be good for their Alzheimer's and vice versa. So a lot of people, and there's been, a, you know, there's been lots on the Bresden diet and all these different things, which are all about effectively trying to treat your Alzheimer's by diet alone. Um, but essentially, you know, like, it's like exercise or anything else. Of course it helps, but it's not going to stop your amyloid and tau protein eventually, you know, just taking over. Um, but there have also been, quite interestingly, some um, medications, and there was one called, um, what's it called? Lizaramide or something, but Lizaracade, I think it was, or something like that, that was... And, and it was a diabetic medication, but people found that diabetics who were taking it, who also had Alzheimer's, which is quite common because they're both common conditions, were actually doing better with respect to their cognition. So there have been various trials with some of those medications as well. Um, but I think the big thing is the brain hates sugar, so... Sugar. Yeah, and sugar is the biggest sort of like addictive substance, more so than cocaine or anything. Where do you do your amyloid and tau? Scans. Scans. So we obviously use a few scanners because we have different centres. But um, we work with Alliance Medical um, in London. Um, we work with Cobalt in Gloucestershire for our Birmingham centre. Um, and we work with a centre in, I think it's in Exeter, for our Bristol and Plymouth centres.
But it, there's um, when we do, we are private patients, we will um, obviously we can also request amyloid scans um, because we do often have people who, particularly if they're in really sort of like high profile and really responsible jobs, they actually do need to know um, what their diagnosis is. Um, and so quite often we will do scans sort of like privately because they just need to know, or for patients who are coming from abroad, etc. Um, but by and large, the, the, and we do those in London as well, um, but the patients who come into the clinical trials, they obviously will have all their PET scans and everything done um, as part of the clinical trial um, screening sort of like workup. So, I mean, in fact, just in terms of all the tests and everything that are done, you know, I mean, it's obviously, it's not at a cost to the individual patient, but that patient is receiving hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of medical care, mm. which is provided by the, the pharmaceutical sponsor. Thank you. And it's all done within like three weeks. So like some of my, I mean like the Essams, for example, just because they're there and you saw them. Um, I mean, they presented to us in lockdown and they would have had full cognitive profile, all of the sort of like cognitive screening, bloods, everything you can think of that could potentially have caused a cognitive problem. Um, mm -hmm. Their MRI scan, um, a PET um, amyloid scan, and they had a PET TAU scan, all probably, well, that, we have to do it all within um, 90 days, but we try and get it all done within about 60 days. I missed the beginning because I was late for projects. Um, yeah. But if, if for inclusion criteria into the trial, yeah. is it anyone with cognitive impairment? So, um, yes, um, but for each study. So what's quite difficult is that the inclusion and exclusion criteria are quite tight for each individual study because obviously the study has to match the patient and the patient has to match the study because that's where the sweet spot of the medication will work. Um, but for the studies we're doing at the moment, they need to have either MCI. So, so broadly, um, so like an MMC anywhere between 20 and 30. A lot of the studies, the patients will have an MMC of 29, 30. And lots of them will still be at work and everything. Um, but where, where they will have um, a specific cognitive deficit will be particularly in short-term memory. So there's a test called R-bands where they have to get less than or equal to sort of like 85 or 95. So, so people who have... The, the sort of like, for the studies at the moment, the ideal patient will be anything between the age of 50 and, 50 and 90, essentially. Um, they will have had... To sort of like progressive concern about their, usually they say their short term memory, but you know, concern about their short term memory over the past, they always say it's like six months, but actually, when you ask them, it's like over the last two years. And um, then, usually, apart from sort of, you know, like having to make lists and, um, you know, forgetting where they put their keys and, um, you know, all the sort of things that they normally complain of, they'll also, you know, maybe having difficulty, you know, remembering if they put a book down for three days, they can't remember. They have more difficulty following instructions if they're soon doing some DIY or something. And then they may have noticed that they tend to sort of like get a bit disorientated or lost in a familiar environment. Um, they've noticed that their facility with numbers is just not quite as sharp as it was. Um, they may be mixing up words and finding that if they don't say what they want to say in a conversation with a group of friends, when they think of it, then by the time it comes to their turn, sort of like, you know, like politely to speak, they'll have forgotten what they wanted to say. Um, and often the sort of like the partner may not have even noticed, but when you point it out to the partner, say, oh yeah, you know, like, yeah. And then the next stage is that they start repeating themselves unknowingly and start, you know, just start sort of like forgetting important, important appointments, you know, birthdays, family names, um, forgetting where they put their car, you know, sort of things like that. And then the next stage is when they're at a point that, and um, we can still see people, because these would be the mild AD dementia, so that, oh, they can go to the shops, you know, like get some milk and bread and stuff, but they, they wouldn't be able to organise a holiday um, or, um, I don't know, do, do sort of like a bit, a bit more sort of like something that required a bit more multitasking or whatever. Um, it's sort of quite, I mean, these must all be really familiar, like you, you see people with this all the time. Um, and then I was saying earlier, I think before you came in, that it is interesting that quite a lot of people develop, they obviously are anxious about this. And then the more sort of like 
to be honest, the more educated and the more intelligent they are, the more coping mechanisms that they will have. So quite often, you could talk to them for five minutes and you might not notice there's anything wrong. Um, but it's because they've just got reminders on their phone, they've, you know, they've just got endless sort of cues to help them. Um, but it's when they start forgetting their cues and they start forgetting their lists that you think, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, the, 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 more, the more educated and intelligent they are, you, there's been a big study that shows that those people have more amyloid in their brain for the same cognitive scores as somebody who has had a, um, like a, a less in-depth education, let's say, or a number of years of education, um, and just sort of like innately is sort of like just less intelligent. Um, so the people who are more intelligent and more educated tend to present when they have more amyloid in their brain, so they're actually more advanced. But I think I think the thing is that it, it is it is difficult because like you know when you're every day you've got and and we you know we have ten thousand people a month contact us and we have to filter through all of those to get the sort of like you know several hundred that are that are suitable. Um, so I do sort of like you know like I think by the time someone comes to see you know their doctor, they are you know they've been worrying about it for a while. Whereas when we get people sort of like, you know, just, you know, from Facebook and everything else, we have we actually do screening on the phone. We do cognitive assessments with them on the phone to, to try and get a sense of whether or not they're in the right range. And then we have all the worried well people who, it's great when we have a study for people who are cognitively normal because, um, you know, that's great, loads of people. I mean, nearly everyone is worried about the memory, to be honest. Mm. I mean, more people are worried about this than anything else. So, you know, even people come into you in the surgery and, I don't know, they tell you about the headaches or something, they're probably also worried about the memory. Um, and, pe and just because the symptoms develop slowly and they're all a bit nebulous, it's not like getting a pain in your tooth. I mean, that's easy. Oh, I've got a pain right here. This is like, well, I don't know, my brain doesn't work quite as well as it did. Uh, uh, join the club. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, let me congratulate you on a truly Nobel Prize <laughs> presentation. I mean, I've been uh, managing dementias for 47 years, as you know, and we get siloed. So I've been blown away by uh, your revelations. Congratulations. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, two questions. The symptomatic treatments, of which I've done three yeah. um, phase three trials, doesn't seem to be a need to do head-to-head uh, -head comparison trials with the kind of act. No. Uh, there's so much data on what happens if you don't have any treatment, mm. and there's so much data on what happens exactly. if you're on, you know, denepazil, yeah. ribostigmine, yeah. or whatever. Yes. That actually, in in some trials, um, in all trials, I want you to be on it. You can be not on them at all, or you, if you are on them, you just need to be on a stable dose for sort of like yes. anything from a month to three months. Yes. But in some of the studies, they're actually even relaxed about you starting them during the yeah. study because they know they know what they do and don't yes. do. So make sure that NICE doesn't insist on that criteria. Oh, no, no, yeah. I don't think well. I mean, to be honest, I think it's um, in France, they don't, they don't prescribe the Nepazil and, and those drugs like at all anymore. And I think it's something like about a third of people, a third of people don't derive any benefit. A third of people can't tolerate them because they're very non-selective for the brain. So they also act on the gut. Yes. And then a third of people can tolerate them and do get some temporary benefit from yes, them. Yes, yes. And that's sort of like... Well, in France, they usually start more on the nepazone than that. Mm. There's a bit of vascular. But mm -hmm. um, the outcomes of the symptomatic phase three trial drugs is similar to lecanemab, mm. but the outcome of the tau trials for the HTM, whatever it mm. is, seem to be even better. Mm. It makes you more... We used to have a... Um, uh, uh, a competition in the early Alzheimer days of the Taoists and the Maoists. You know, they're both Chinese <laughs> philosophers. <laughs> mm, <laughs> we yeah. seem to be more like a Taoist, actually, yeah. than a Maoist. With the Maoist well, being the amyloid, yeah. Taoist being the Tao yeah. protein. I, th um, I think, yeah, I think, mm, sorry. Yeah. No, I, was gonna say, I think what sort of like generally people sort of think now is that the amyloid probably does sort of like come first. So probably the the sort of like anti-amyloid treatments yeah. will probably be more of the preventative type yeah. treatments and the 
the, t the anti tau treatments are more so like when you do start to get symptoms. But there was a huge, you know, there was such a massive anti amyloid theory mm -hmm. that very little, um, I mean, I think, you know, it's a little political as well, but very little, mm -hmm. let's call it research funding was going into the tau yes. side. Whereas now I would say that, you know, tau is going crazy. Like, you know, everybody is developing anti tau drugs. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, like anti um, neurofilament lie, anti inflammatory, you know, it, it's just, yeah, I mean, it, it's sort of like, at you know, one level, it sort of is. It's sort of getting so complicated that it's almost like, mm. but at another level, it, it's really great because it's not going to be one medication. Exactly. And, and, and the great um, vision is that we can have three or four medications, disease <coughs> modifying and two symptomatic yeah. Um, yeah. treatments. So yeah. there's a, a great sense, yeah. which brings me back to the point of etiology, etiopathogenesis. Immuno-infective, as well as Oh my goodness, the, well there's so many, there's so many, there yeah, sense. there's so many different sort of like, um, I mean everything from literally, there was, there was actually a study that we did um, for a medication that was against the toxins that are produced um, by gin, gingivalis infection oh, right. in the gum, yes, gingivitis. Yes. And the theory was that the um, gingivitis, like everyone, you know, it's quite so yeah, common. So, like, people get gingivitis even if they don't know they have it. And it sort of like, so, you know, like eventually it gets across the blood brain barrier and um, it sets up these sort of like ginger pains, which are sort of like toxic to the, yeah. to the brain cells. Um, and we actually did a medication that neutralized the uh, ginger pains um, to try to see if that would decrease the progression of the, um, you know, the, the cell death. Um, that, that particular study didn't, didn't work. Um, but, you know, there's so many theories like this that I think people are still, you know, they're still working on all sorts of different things. VARA is obviously a big one, and there's always stuff about viral. Um, I think, you know, again, anything that's, that's related to age, it's sort of like people always worry about epigenetics. And, and obviously, you know, like our genes change, change with time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's another theory. But I, I think it's all, you know, in the end of the day, it's like all wrapped up in ageing, which, as I said, like, you know, we don't really understand that well. So it's probably all DNA and telomeres and all that sort of stuff. Um, and scalar energy nowadays. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Whoever's going to work that out, though, they will. They will win the Nobel Prize. Blood brain barrier. So, well, blood brain barrier is obviously really important in in CTE. I mean, that's that tends to be sort of like that's a that's sort of like a different process where the blood brain barrier is sort of like being sort of like breached and then development of um, new inflammatory factors that then sort of trigger, well, trigger tau. So that's quite interesting, it's not amyloid at all. And the tau in, in CTE is, is sort of quite similar to the tau in frontotemporal dementia. Um, whereas, in amyloid, whereas in Alzheimer's, it's amyloid and the tau. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>